Thank you. Um, so I'd like you to imagine you're holding a stick in your hand and um, you press on the stick and um, half of a load on the stick goes to one finger and half goes to the other finger. But if you put a, a shell, a nut shell on your hand and press down, then the, the load will go all the way around. So instead of 50% and 50%, you could divide that into 360, so the load is spread across the surface. So if it was a stick, the, stick would, the thickness of the stick would be the resistance, but if it's a shell, the thickness is the resistance, but also the fact that on a stick, when you pressed on it, it would move sideways. The thickness would help, but it would move sideways. But on a shell, when you press on the top of it, it can't move anywhere, because the structure below it, wherever you press, is pushing backwards at it. So the, the form is in the geometry. So that simple thing of a shell um, um, appears in, in nature in many different forms. And we particularly learnt the lessons from seashells. And um, seashells, there are five ways that seashells are strong. One is in that three-dimensional curvature. One is in the corrugation. Everybody knows corrugation is strong. It's like a kind of folded plate. One is through distortion. Um, and the distortion basically helps uh, take the form from one shape to another so that the form um, carries diagonally or laterally across the surface. I'll explain that more later. Um, shells also, the leading edge quite often curls back on itself and becomes like a beam, and that acts like a torsion beam. And then the fifth one is the nodules on a shell, the bits that poke up. Sometimes they give local stiffening to the shell in a specific place. So we learned um, these uh, five lessons from looking at seashells. Um, it wasn't entirely obvious at first, um, but what we've uh, married them with, um, which is what makes shell lace, is we've married them with the art of tailoring. So if you, uh, a, t a tailor basically takes a flat sheet and then puts a flat sheet onto a curved form, generally our bodies, and th that curved form is then cut in such a way that it will hold its strength. So the cutting of the fabric in such a form, give, uh, flat sheets and then bringing them together can hold stiff form. And that's something that basically tailoring's, although tailoring's a really ancient art, it really only developed in the 17th century. Um, and that's when people started to make garments that held their shape, or when garments started to hug the body. Before that, generally f fabric was just hanging on people. Um, lace is basically an additive process, and, um, and basically it's pure structure, as one person described to us. But when a caterpillar eats a leaf, that's a bit closer to what we're doing in shell lace. It's basically... The caterpillar takes everything away apart from the structure, so that the shell, it will still be there. So um, the, the third element in the scenario that makes shell lace is that um, we use digital tools to make it. So we use rhino and grasshopper, and we use digital tools to fabricate it. So we use laser cutting and water jet and fiber cutting. And um, it's the combination of these three things that come together to, to make shell lace. So, and, um, this is a sort, of, uh, um, a sort of diagram that shows kind of where we've been in five years. We started with a project over here um, for a seaside shelter, and um, we did that with Arabs. It was Arabs wanted to do a competition with us, so we picked that one. And um, I mean, basically, what I'm going to I'm going to show you some of these projects, not all of them. And it's a sort of um, it's a kind of journey of quite a lot of failures. So we've learned an awful lot through our failure and through not winning. Um, so, this is the first competition. Um, the competition was called The Next Wave, and it was in Bex Hill, and it was to provide a series of shelters along the seafront um, that were going to give shelter from the sun and from the wind, um, mainly to old people who were um, spending time on the seafront there. Um, so, generally, when we start a project, we're always, we're, we're, I'd say, uh, we're storytellers, and here we wanted to kind of find a way that was something about the waves and something about the sea. And so we started kind of looking at sort of wave-like and shell-like forms. And um, we got to a point where we made this paper model here. And um, it was just made of strips of paper because it kind of gave us the, shell, the shape we wanted. But when you took it in your hand like this, it kind of flexed. So it was kind of hopelessly flexible. So what we did to that was we added a bit of plasticine onto the back of it. And the piece of plasticine was in a kind of triangular rib form. And it was on the back of it. We took the rib off and then traced around it, and then cut out the pieces of paper and put them back together again. So basically, we tailored the shell. And actually, what happened was it was less material, but all of a sudden, it was very, very strong. So we'd made a kind of folded plate structure. And it wasn't origami, because the things don't fold out of one plate. It was actually tailoring. And tailoring is very different to origami, because origami supposes that you can bend it into one sheet. So 
Um, then we went back into plasticine again and said, okay, well now we've got that principle, what do we want to get out of the form? Um, so we had to make a space that was going to be an inner space and an outer space. Um, and then we went into Rhino. That drawing seems to be disappearing a little bit. Yeah, so uh, we went into Rhino and started building it in Rhino. And then we um, sent it across to Arabs. And Arabs um, um, basically analyzed it with uh, um, uh, a general structural analysis tool they have. And basically, this shows where the stress is on the structure. So the red is what you want to avoid. So this little dot of red over here shows that there was some stress at that point. And funnily enough, the model I showed you at the beginning, after three years it broke, and it broke at exactly that point. So the stress model is pretty accurate. So we made the first model by um, unfolding those pieces. They're all developable. That means basically it doesn't twist or distort so much, but actually you can turn it into a flat sheet so that you can put it back together again. And, um, and then we built that structure out of it. Um, and then in terms of a competition, well, um, a good friend Neil McLaughlin was actually the judge. And uh, um, he told me that the mayor said, uh, apparently people found it quite interesting, but the mayor said it's full of holes. And, it didn't, and we didn't get anywhere. So we didn't get shortlisted at all. Um, but what we learned was this. We learned about curvature, corrugation, distortion, and, and stiffening. And, um, and then we added kind of perforation to it because we wanted people to have visibility through it. And the old people wanted to know who was behind them. And they wanted, we didn't want to stop all of the wind because if you stop all of the wind, then the structure gets blown over. So the wind has to, has to be able to permeate the structure as well to dry it out too. Um, and these, these, these are the elements that we, we learned from the shell there. So those are the five, five lessons we learned. Um, and in some ways, um, I'd say, uh, as a practice Tonkin Liu, we're kind of storytellers. And, and ev almost everything we do, we win um, through competitions. We do some domestic work, too. Um, we do sort of uh, urban realm and landscape work, um, public art work, and then quite a lot of housing, uh, houses. Um, but generally, um, it's through comp the competition process. So I'm going to show you the competitions that kind of led to um, the shell lace process. So, we were doing this at the time we did the competition, and actually the pieces of paper you saw that made that model were actually the cut-up drawings from this project. And this was for Dover Esplanade, and I'm showing it to you because it also has a sort of technical angle. So although we're telling a story about a place, we, it, we, we use a process called asking, looking, playing, making. And the making part is always about trying to tell the story in, in a kind of technical way. So to d demonstrate that, what we noticed about Dover is Dover's great, but um, because of a fantastic harbour, um, there, are, there are almost no waves, so it's rather dull. So we told a story about three waves that came to Dover Esplanade. And we called the three waves the, the lifting wave that lifted you on the es onto the Esplanade from the beach, the resting wave that helped people give shelter from the wind, and the lighting wave that basically made it um, an attractive place to be at night. And how do we make those walls? Well, we wanted to make it in concrete, and we'd never built anything in concrete before. And I'd always felt that concrete should be a very fluid um, uh, form because it's a fluid uh, material process. Um, but to make a, a very fluid form can become very, very expensive. So we wanted to find a very economical way of making a three-dimensional form. So when, um, when you make a cut with a CNC machine, um, you cut a piece of wood, and the, you always have a waste piece of wood. And we felt, well, that was a waste, literally. We wanted to use that piece of wood. So what we did is we took a whole load of pieces of wood here, and we stacked them on top of each other. And we cut them all with a little kind of ripple in the front of them. And then the waste pieces, we, we, um, so if you imagine those are steps, 25 mil MDF, uh, MDF sheets. Um, so all the cut ones, so basically we made something like that, and then all the waste ones were here, and then we opened it out. So we'd made an A and an AB. And, um, and then we made them in different sizes. So they met at the top and met at the bottom. So you got an A and an A, a B and a BB and a C and a CC. And we could put them in together in different ways so we could make it go anywhere and more or less do anything. And the, on the front of it, basically, there was a kind of ripple, and the ripple was to kind of catch light. And so that's how it's made. Um, it's the um, MDF layers stacked together there. Um, and and what, what that gave us was something that kind of caught light and caught shadows. But when the sun came out, it caught the top of it too. So when the sun went in and out, it actually gave a different, it gave a kind of variance in the, um, in the quality of it. Um, so there it is being made up in Stoke-on-Trent um, by a, a, a precast concrete company called Thorp, who were fantastic. And we also, when we made the ramp, so that's for lifting wave, when you make a three-dimensional curve, 
it's very complicated to make a three-dimensional curve. And, and Fork said, we can't do that. It's too complex because it's changing in direction. We were making an S-curve like this, and it was going to slope in two different directions. Um, so they said, is there any other way you can do it? So we basically showed them, actually, we did it with a pack of biscuits in the office in the meeting. Um, um, but basically showed them that actually if you make a staircase, basically you are making a kind of three-dimensional form and you can take it anywhere you want. So those pack of cards were stacked. So the ramp isn't actually a ramp, it's a tiny staircase. So each one of those is five millimeters tall and they, so they can go in either direction. So in this way, again, we were able to make very three-dimensional form but very, very cheaply. Um, so that's the um, esplanade with the ramp and the, the waveforms in the background. And the waveforms... You can see it kind of um, rise up quite high, and the benches are tucked into them so they, people can shelter from the wind. Um, and you can see the sort of way the, uh, the, the top of them still expresses um, the way it's built. So, and you can see there the way they're waving in and out. And, we, and the brief had said that it had to look good from the castle, and that's a view from the castle. So it had to kind of, as well as working at that scale of the ripple we showed you with the light, it had to kind of work on an urban scale. So that's what I'm saying about the detail was actually also telling you about the kind of bigger picture. Um, so we, we knew through doing this project that concrete was incredibly complicated and expensive, and so that's why we, we wanted to find another way of making these shelters in Bexhill. And the other project we'd been doing at the time was this. We were doing um, a penthouse in Marlebone, and um, when you're in a penthouse, like on this level here, if you open the window, then you get an awful lot of wind because wind's high, wind speed rises as you, as you raise higher. So if you open a window in a penthouse, everything kind of gets blown off because the wind gusts a lot. So, and we'd, we'd, had, we'd done a couple of penthouses, and so we knew this is a problem, so we wanted to let the air come in slowly. So we told them a story about a forest of invisible trees that breathed, and actually these trees were in the apartment, and uh, they were all the way around the apartment, and in skylights that were above the apartment, and each of the trees was slightly different. And behind the trees were flaps, and actually when a sensor in the skylight, so the skylight had flaps in two, so as a heat, um, see if I can go back. Um, so we all know hot air rises. So as the hot air rises, basically the hot air would, um, whoops, um, the hot air would go up into the skylight. A sensor would pick it up, and basically some flaps would open. And when those flaps would open, basically some flaps at the bottom of the windows would open, so that cold air came in. So it was a bit like a sort of sash window. So basically the whole place could breathe. So that's. And what we discovered when we were making this, we had a prototype made of these perforated panels, uh, which also had radiators behind and light behind, so they did, they did many, many things. They also had the smoke detectors, the speakers, everything else you want to lose was sort of hidden behind these panels. But what we learned about the panels was it was incredibly cheap to get um, um, aluminium laser cut. So all of these panels, there were you know, hundreds of them, only cost 24 grand. So we, and we had one of them in the backyard, and um, we, what we discovered is it was incredibly flexible. So we, we had put sort of two and two together to make that shelter we were, we were um, suggesting. So, so basically, um, we'd made the shelter at the top from the principles we'd been learning technically from those other projects. And um, although we didn't get anywhere in that competition, Arup said, um, um, that was fun. There's a lot of potential in that. Um, and they felt we'd kind of invented a new breed of sort of single surface structure because tailoring hadn't been really brought into um, single surface structures before. So they said, let's do another competition. So we did a competition for an energy company in Lisbon. And, um, and this was about making a space across a motorway um, in between two huge stadiums. And um, it was sponsored by an energy company. So we suggested a bridge that would catch the, the, the light of the energy of the sun through um, uh, photovoltaics and then um, give the energy back and, and glow at night. And it was a cycling bridge and a pedestrian bridge and we added a kind of running track to the top of it too to make it like a stadium, like between the two stadiums it linked. And here the structure was basically, um, and it gave out shadows during the night and during the day, which had this sort of solar pattern on, which is the sort of symbol of Portugal. And um, basically the structure was a bit like the top of the uh, Bexhill shelter, uh, the V-shaped the v uh, beams, but what we did is we put a, um, a deck across the top, and that effectively turned it into torsion beams and in between the torsion beams, which are these ones, were some compression plates, and they held the torsion beams apart. And so Arabs sort of analyze it, uh, things endlessly, and um, this bridge turned out to only need to be eight millimeters thick to span 40 meters. So again, um, it, you know, it had great potential, but again, we didn't get anywhere in the competition. Um, but we didn't give up. And um, 
the RIBA asked us to do, you know, people have seen the Regent Street window things. Well, the first round, we did one of those Regent Street windows. And we felt like we'd made um, a vault. And a vault was like a cave. And we felt we'd make a kind of a beam. But the beam was like a bone. And we felt like we wanted to make a column and maybe make a column like a tree. So um, again, we went straight to the plasticine. So there's always this thing about the hand. So we always make things in hand first. We never make it in the computer before we've, we've stated what we want to do by sculpting it. Um, and then it goes into Rhino, and then it gets analyzed, and then Arabs um, start to worry about the little red bits, and, um, and generally it's always very accurate. And, um, and then uh, we worked with Millennium Models, and um, it was made out of, we wanted to demonstrate that the process was strong, and we wanted to do that by using a very uh, a material that everyone knew, knew had no strength, but also was very, very cheap. So we just made it out of one mil card, so this whole structure is just made out of one mil card, and yet it's actually quite rigid. And everyone was kind of quite shocked about that. And one of the sort of innovations here was that we discovered that when we made the column, first of all, we made the column just with the sort of the ribs on. But we discovered it was like a kind of um, a rubber vase. It would just flex. And we realized the sort of the, the distortion thing, we're sort of putting these curves into plan. And actually, when we twisted the column, what that did was it locked in. So it distorted it, and it locked the strength into the column. So the column then became a kind of stiff structure. And at first, Arabs didn't think that would work, and we'd have to have spaces inside the column. But actually, in reality, when it was fixed, it didn't need any spaces. And it's because it couldn't move. There was nowhere it could go. So once you join these pieces together, they simply can't go anywhere. And that's the secret of their strength, in a way. Um, and that was in the window. And for us, it was a nice demonstration of the strength of uh, potentially a strong form contrasted against the stone. but. Um, Again, I'd say it was a failure, because um, uh, we saw lots of people taking pictures of it, but the architectural press ignored it. And actually, in terms of the windows, it didn't seem to get as much attention as the other ones. And I think it was because people just looked at it and thought it was like fluff. No one could really understand what it was. And they didn't really understand that it had any technical merit to it. So we felt, OK, we've got to find some way of kind of taking it to another scale to make it look more structural. Um, you know, we'd worked quite hard at the joints, how the jointing worked. and um, uh, so that was quite complicated. Um, maybe just to put this into a tiny bit of historical perspective, um, last year we took our students to uh, southern Bohemia. That's, in, uh, that's not far from Prague, um, where the diamond vaults are. And the diamond vaults are 500 years old, and they were built by the kind of princes of Bohemia. And basically what they are is they're kind of compression vaults, um, and they were made on, on brick, um, uh, um, on t timber formers, but bricks were laid on at 90 degrees like this, and was, was, sp was spun up into these kind of um, rafting ribs. Um, and then the whole roof is kind of solid above. And so the whole thing works in compression. And um, uh, what's interesting about these is you can follow, visually, you can follow the lines of force. Um, so although their compression structures are incredibly heavy, um, they were very inspirational to us um, after we'd kind of learned um, about what we were doing, the tailoring, was actually telling a story about the way the forces were moving through a structure. And um, I won't show you many other um, single surface structures, but maybe the most important one is Eladio Diesta. And um, uh, Eladio Diesta's structure, his, his structure span, this is spanning 40 meters too, and it does it in a depth of something like 150 millimeters with one brick. And um, the way that works is it's actually a catenary structure, and um, it has this form in section. Um, and the catenary is changing as it goes back through the section like this. Um, and so it has a double curvature, and that's called a Gaussian vault, was the name that was given to that. So it's three-dimensional curvature, and he can make it out of the bricks because the bricks are a very small unit. So he's getting three-dimensional curvature um, in a very simple structure. I and mean, then he's using the people who made it to test it, obviously, on the roof there. So, um, so to come back to this, we felt, well, let's do a large competition. So this was a competition for... Um, it's a ferry terminal, it's in Taiwan, and the brief asked for a building that would house all of the administrative functions that would um, uh, be about the, the passage of people in and out of the country, and mainly it was people coming from China on a boat to Taiwan. So um, the story here for us was about when you're traveling across the ocean in a boat, you know you're traveling to this island. Everyone has in in their mind what Taiwan's like. And Taiwan's an incredibly mountainous island, and it's covered in forests. So we wanted to make something that looked like an island that was covered in a forest. 
And actually, the forest in this case was a shell-laced structure, and the mountain was the administrative structure that was basically a, a huge staircase um, that people could move up on top of to watch their relatives coming and going, because that was an awful lot of what the ferry terminal was about. Um, and inside, it made a... a um, in, in Hong Kong, it's incredibly hot. It's a tropical climate, so you need to reduce the amount of light. So on top of the roof, we had an ETFE structure that removed 70% of the light, and then the shell lace was perforated to 30%, so the light levels came down to something like 21% of the, of the daylight. So, um, so there you can see roughly how the building worked, and you can see the shell lace structure is always just one skin, and then the ETFE is on the top. Um, there was a glass structure that joined the columns together here and here, and around the, around the edge was another structure, so you could walk around the whole building. And the air was basically sort of coming up and out of the building with thermal chimneys, and there were all sorts of other um, thermal um, characteristics. And, and again, Arab's um, environmental team worked on this. And um, that's the structure of the roof, um, and that had the ETFE on top of it, and that's the structure of the roof of the ETFE. Um, and there it is um, from the sea, and there it is at night if you were arriving from China at night. And um, well, what happened at that competition? We, so we arrive in Taiwan to do a lecture, and um, um, there's somebody doing the uh, tr uh, interpreting uh, of a professor of a university, and so he hasn't seen what we're going to show. And uh, he said, I'll have to stop you there um, when we showed the, uh, the last project, because um, he was the chair of the judges, and um, he thought this project should have won, but he said he couldn't even get it shortlisted because and no one believed it was buildable. And um, so he was kind of raving about it. And then once we'd explained shell lace, he, kind of re you know, he really liked it more. And actually, that's what we were there at the university to do. We did a kind of shell lace workshop with them, having just done one in Japan. And, um, and so the lesson for us was there that we have, to kind of make, we have to make something that's more believable. So again, we have to kind of realign what we're doing. So yet, yet another failure. Um, took us to, well, what, what on earth can we win? So we have to lower our expectations. Um, so um, we were asked to enter a competition um, um, in Burnley, and we'd already done a project in Burnley, and um, this is called the Singing Ringing Tree. Um, it's, a, it's a public art project, and it was the, the art project was called Panopticon. And the brief was to make something that was about visibility, and it was the idea of the project was to draw people out into the countryside um, to make them appreciate the beauty of a natural countryside around Burnley. And um, there were three sites, well, it wasn't just Burnley, it was other sites, and there were three sites, and we, we asked them, well, um, which of the site, which of, what have the sites all got in common? And they said they're all incredibly windy. And, uh, and then we said, well, which one's the windiest? And they said, Burnley. So we said, well, do that, because it just felt if, the, if they were all windy, it should be about the wind. And so um, we knew we wanted to make a sound out of the wind, and we knew we wanted to make the wind sing, and we knew we wanted to make a story a bit like a Pied Piper of Hamlet, where there was a story about a tree on a hill, um, because the only thing on a hill that tells you about the wind is a tree. And, um, and so we wanted to make a tree that basically told people to come out of the city and, um, and enjoy the countryside. And so we told a story about a man with his dog, and the, uh, the man with a dog goes to the top of the hill, and the dog starts barking in the mist, and then uh, he hears these strange sounds. And then the mist clears and he sees the tree, and then he goes down to the, the city and tells everybody about it. And now, apparently, um, um, so our idea was to put kind of Burnley on the map, and actually now the audience survey map, audience survey of England, has now put the singing ring tree on the map of Burnley. So somehow we've been successful in that process. And um, the way it works is it's like a pan pipe. So these little slits here, um, um, when you blow across them, they make a tune. And it took us an awful long time to kind of make that work. Three months, in fact. It took us three months to even make a sound. And we did it by putting tubes out of a car window and, and trying different slots and driving up and down the road. Because we knew what the wind speed was. We knew the wind speed was between 5 and 60 miles an hour. And the singing ring tree sounds quite good at 5 miles an hour. Um, but when the wind blows at 60 miles an hour, it sounds as like witches screeling. And, um, <laughs> Um, but that also went down quite well, because the witches of Pendle, that's the next hill. So people kind of saw that as appropriate. And um, so it's been very successful, and it's had something like 4 million hits on YouTube, maybe, maybe 5 now. And um, supposedly hundreds of thousands of people go to see it. And even the Burnley Football Club, they have a song that says, The Singing Ringing Tree at some point. So that's a sort of... Um, um, but, so when we asked us to do another competition, we thought, well, we'll never win because we won that one. Um, and the competition was for a sort of... Um, 
a gateway building to a lower part of Burnley that had a new technical college that housed fashion and high-tech industries. So it seemed really appropriate for the shell lace. It was next to a viaduct, so it had arches, um, and it had three, uh, three roads meeting together. So we made a three-way structure that was made out of arches, and um, here it was made out of stainless steel. And um, so the story we told this time, it's called Rainbow Gate, and the rain was about Burnley's the rainiest um, city in the country, and that's what made it famous. It rained so much, it fills the rivers, and the rivers turn the mills, and the mills is what made Burnley prosperous. So we told a story about the rain falling, and when the rain fell, after the rain fell, the sun comes out, which doesn't happen very often, but it does, and, um, and then you get rainbows. So um, that was the kind of, the, the sort of technical story about kind of place making and weather making. And in terms of the shell lace structure, basically it's made out of three mil um, stainless steel, and these pieces, as you can see, would probably be reaching from here to there. And if you pick them up off the floor, you can whip them, and they will just they will flex like a bit of paper. Because although three mil, you can't bend it here. When, when it's scalar, it's incredibly flexible. Uh, but when they get put together, they become very, very strong for this kind of locked-in strength reason. So, so here they are. They all get flopped together and then um, got welded, stitch welded together. Um, and that's a view from on top. So we walked around on top of it quite a lot, so we're very happy about the strength of it, not a problem. There's quite a lot of us, you know, there was probably about 10 of us wandering around on top of it, and um, it's not really an issue. Um, and these are the formers, so the formers are the thing we used to transport it, and uh, they took it to site. And when it arrives on site, we're all kind of ready there. And um, when um, we get a call from Burnley Council, that they say, it's not strong enough, it's too floppy. And, um, You've got to prove it's going to work before we're going to let you build it. And um, Burnley Council were actually difficult all the way. In fact, we won the competition. And um, when we won the competition, they told us, you've got to build it for this budget. And we said, well, actually, you know, you didn't tell us exactly that when we started. And, uh, and so I'm not sure we can do it for that. So we're going to have to decline. And they said, OK, we're going to sue you. So, um, and because the other thing they said is, you have to be the main contractor. And we said, well, we're architects, you know. We can't be the main contractor. And they said, that's it, we're going to sue you because we've spent all this money on the competition. So we had to kind of um, become the main contractor. Um, so a bit like Nervi and Diestra and all those people who made those structures, they were always generally the main, so we were kind of forced into it. Um, so so we, had to, we had to do it. And actually, so we worked with Mike Smith, studio, who made the singing ringing tree. Um, and Mike's great, and uh, he, he made it all happen. And um, somehow we kind of got it there. But when the pieces arrived, um, the, the engineer from the council saw them coming off the lorry and saw how flexible they were and went up and started shaking them and was saying, they're far too thin. You know, there's no strength in this. You know, it's never going to work. And um, so Arabs then had to prove that actually you could get a certain number of grown men on top of it. And, um, and once they'd seen those, those uh, statistics, they kind of let us do it. But the reality is, once it was all put together and there was just three bolted joints, when those bolted joints were put together, basically it was incredibly strong, and then they were kind of happy. Um, and then the slots in the centre were basically full of prisms, and the prisms, like I said before, uh, when the sun comes out, it makes uh, rainbows on the ground. And so that's the structure with the, you can see the kind of context of the, um, um, and then that's the structure of it. So lots of people are sitting under it, kind of getting burnt by the rainbows in the, in the, in the summer sun. So, um, and that's the cutting pattern. And one thing we were learning about the cutting patterns was there's always like these tailors cutting patterns, but some of them are quite inefficient. So this isn't really the cutting pattern. We, it gets nested because these pieces are so, so long and they're actually broken down into little pieces. Um, and, um, but what we wondered is, was it possible to do something that didn't have any wastage? Um, and we'd, always, um, we'd always been interested in Escher, and at the AA we talked quite a lot about tessellation. And so we wondered whether we could take two ideals here. Could we take something that was completely flat and turn it into something three-dimensional? Um, and so we, we basically, uh, it took an awful long time. So that is the cutting pattern for the structure I'm going to show you. So each piece, basically, there's no wastage. Each piece is usable, and they're identical. They could, they could have different perforation, um, but they, they stick next to each other. But the interesting thing is that you, to make it three-dimensional, you take this one and turn it to 180 degrees, and then join it back to that one. And then it goes from being flat into being three-dimensional. So that sounds easy, but that took us, I think, about three months again to work that out. And that was all of the, all of the basic um, experiments kind of leading to that. 
Um, and that's what it made, basically. And the competition was for a, uh, a shelter, a relief shelter, a card shelter. And again, we got shortlisted. It was an American competition, um, but we didn't win. Um, but it didn't matter. We were kind of, we were pleased. We'd made the strongest structure we'd made, I think. And it was, um, it's still one of the strongest ones, I think, because it's actually almost as closest to a seashell because a lot of seashells have that distortion. And but what the distortion does, this is the easiest one to describe it on, because it moves across like this, if a force is applied, a, the force, but basically the, um, the Vs carry the load like a beam. They're like a hollow beam. And actually, um, the distortions like this move from side to side. So the forces can span this way, but with this distortion, they also act like a whole surface. So the forces can move laterally across the structure. Um, so, and this one was um, potentially one of the thinnest. So there it is in... Uh, um, and then Arabs, um, you know, they're not fed up with us yet. So um, they asked, they were doing a competition to, um, they were having a, an exhibition of their headquarters uh, of 60 years of bridges. And they had all sorts of bridges by Renzo and um, Ovarup and um, really nice bridges. And they wanted a bridge of the future. So we worked with Ed Clark, um, who we work with with all of these projects. And he's the engineer who does all of the serpentine pavilions, or used to do. Uh, and um, so. <coughs> the brief was just to make a bridge that basically um, demonstrated the properties that we'd been looking at. So what we basically made was a torsion structure. So again, it's a torsion beam. So it's a closed, well, it's not closed because it's perforated, but it's a triangulated structure. But what it does is it translates or tran uh, um, into something that pops up and becomes an arch. And that arch spans across, and then that arch becomes a column. So there's a sort of transformation from one type to another. And then it transforms at this really complicated junction. And this is where sometimes in the computer it's too complicated. You can't see what you're doing. So we took this screen grab because some, it's really difficult to even understand that, even if you're the guy who built it. You know, in Rhino, it's still so complicated that you're controlling these surfaces, and they all need to remain developable. So it gets incredibly complicated. So quite often we just go back to the plasticine. So when we need to solve a simple junction, we just build things in plasticine. And that's, it was through plasticine that we kind of invented that um, uh, transforming structure. Um, that's, for, uh, that's for cutting plan. Um, that's uh, Millennium Models again, sort of many hands again. And then that was a model that was in the kind of Royal Academy. Um, so that was good for us. We never imagined it would get into the Royal Academy. And um, so that was a kind of good result. So there are, there are some good bits in there. Um, and we won a prize, actually, at the Royal Academy. Um, Lendlease um, um, uh, gave us a prize and asked us to look at um, a shopping centre. We'd always imagined that um, maybe Chalet structure would get used for train stations or cathedrals or, you know, wonderful civic projects like that. And then they asked us to look at Blue Water. And, um, but we thought, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, Blue Water still wants to be a kind of big span structure um, with columns. So... The, the aim for us was, again, to look at some different aspect of it. And we talked about repetition before. And here we looked at repetition. Could we make a massive structure? Um, the blue water structure is enormous. Uh, this spans um, 23 meters and 18 meters or something. And we, we can make the whole thing out of just two molds. We made a Y and through rotational symmetry, put two Ys together, and made an X and put two Xs together. And that was a Y as well. Um, and, then, and then those could be made in a, a, a number of different um, 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 formers. Because what we learned with the, with the Rainbow Gate was actually the cost of a former was £11,000 and the cost of the stainless steel was £11,000. So the former was as expensive as the steel. So we realised that if we could reuse the former over and over again, we could actually bring the cost down. And here at Lendlease, um, the problem for us was we were battling with the QS. Because the QS said, have you ever built one of these things before? You know, and we showed him the one in, in Burnley. And of course, that was tiny and not significant enough for him to be impressed by. Um, and um, eventually, the job just sort of dis disappeared. And actually, it, I don't think anything's going to get built. But um, it was a sort of skepticism of the, um, um, of the quantity surveyors, in a way, that uh, um, was the sort of nail in the coffin for us, I think. Um, but what we did do through that process was also look at another thing. The perforation always had been done in a kind of um, a visual way. We unrolled them and then visually put the perforations on. And we had some clues from um, um, Arabs, basically about the margins and the maximum size of a hole. And with those, they were simple parameters. We visually then used them. But what we invented here was a process where we could take the stress map 
and turn it into black and white, and then take the black and white stress map and, um, uh, in regions, and then start to use that as feeds for the batteries in Grasshopper, uh, so that we could kind of perforate according to the amount of stress. So, and that's how we did that. And then that led to, if you go, and, I don't know if anyone's seen the exhibition, but in the exhibition we've got um, a structure um, we call a steel prototype, and um, basically it's made out of uh, 0.7 mil thick steel. Um, we originally thought it was going to be one and a half mil thick, but because we couldn't get any sponsorship, we had to pay for it ourselves. Um, it was much cheaper to buy 0.7, and um, it was on offer, so we bought it really cheap. And um, I think we really pushed it to the limit, because when we work out how the, the, the thickness to span ratio, so a lot of our structures of a thickness to span ratio is, um, I think in, so in diesters, the, the, span, the span to height ratio is 1 to 15. Um, and in ours, it's generally kind of in that region, somewhere 1 in 25, 1 to 20, something like that. So a normal span to height ratio. But in uh, uh, diesters, his um, thickness of material to span is 1 to 250. But in ours, it's 1 to 2,000. But in this one, it's 1 to 7,000. And, um, and, and actually, when we were putting it together with Alex, who was here last year, um, there was a dreadful moment where we just thought it's just going to crumple, you know, because we've kind of pushed it basically too far beyond its limit. Um, but thankfully, it didn't. So um, it's still there. And um, it's just kind of made it, I'd say. But it's, uh, we were going to do some load testing on it. But I think as soon as we hung anything on it, I think it might collapse. So um, it would have been better if we'd used one and a half mil. So that's at the exhibition. And um, I hope some of you will be able to get along. And then this is the last competition we have won, so there's some good news at the end. And um, this, this, was a, this was a bridge competition that had, I think, 180 entries from around the world. And um, we got shortlisted. And uh, we told a story in the shortlisting. It's a meadow, and it's in Salford. I don't know if you, any of you know Salford. but So Salford University is over here, Salford City is here, and the meadow is here. The meadow has not been connected to anything for 40 years, and so it's just been wilderness. And it has a, amazing potential, but never gets used, because nobody can get to it. So they wanted a bridge that joined the city to the meadow to the university, and there's another bridge over on the top there. So we have told us a story about a boy who went to the meadow and found a magic seed and ran home with a magic seed, and the seed fell out of his pocket, and he lost the seed, and um, he went home and told his parents, and then he went back the next morning, and um, all of a sudden, where he dropped the seed, the seed had turned into a bridge. So it's about this kind of delicate thing that became a kind of ten, ten, tendril-like bridge that spanned across uh, the river, that kind of took the direction of, from the city and the direction to the university, and then bent to cross across the river in the shortest direction possible. So, and then we sort of got, so again, we start in plasticine. So we made, I think we made, dozens of these, and this was sort of when we were getting close. We wanted to make just one huge, long, um, um, cantilevered structure that would almost come to nothing in the center. Um, and then but we had a chat with Arabs, and we were worried about what this was all going to do, and we knew it was going to kind of crumple and crease, and actually it really wants to go, wanted, the forces wanted to go this way. So we realized we got the knife out and just cut it out, and actually realized that if it was just this piece, that was doing all of the work. So it kind of became a propped cantilever, and then we realized if we put something else here, then all of a sudden it was basically a kind of an arch with a deck separated. So that was the kind of moment we realized what we got. And that then was translated into the art. So there's an arch that goes through the deck and, and, um, and then becomes a kind of social space in the center. And that arch is then has these tubes going through them that basically um, take the torsion beam and pass through it so that um, the sides of the torsion beam are held apart from each other. Um, because otherwise you get a thing called hungry horse, um, where the steel basically warps. So you need to hold the steel plates apart. Um, and normally that's done with um, spaces inside. But by making pieces go across it, we could make it sort of transparent. And by doing that, we were in a way making another sort of biomimetic link. And that was to a kind of eagle bone. And an eagle bone does something very similar. It has a, a stress skin structure on the outside, but inside it has a truss-like structure. Um, and that was the bridge um, model that probably won the competition for us. And then we found a company up in Yorkshire who can make it. Um, they, they were already making triangular torsion beams. 
They're already making, uh, what they do is they have a steel plate, they have a massive workshop with steel plates, and they weld bits of steel to the floor, and then they can take um, sheets of steel, and they push them onto this um, structure, and if they won't go, they just apparently they bang them with bags of uh, concrete until they can fall into place, so it's, it all sounds quite crude. But once they're in place, you put another one on it, and then you lock it in, and so the sort of tension's locked into the surface. And then the tubes, they already do plasma cutting and a water jet cutting, so they can do that. Um, I'm not sort of view of what it might be like from above. And it was important for us that um, the best view of this bridge is going to be from the pub. And um, there's a pub on the river here. And we felt it was right that actually the, the area is called Middlewood Loop. And um, the, 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 uh, the meadow is called Meadow Loop. And we felt that actually our bridge should make a loop. And um, we felt that... There's a weir, and if you know about weirs, then you know that below a weir is always rough water and above a weir is always still water. And because it's got very deep banks, it's very, very dark, and there are a lot of trees, so the water is very dark, the water is very still, so there's nearly always a perfect reflection. And so the bridge gets kind of reflected um, in, in the still black water, um, and that's sort of where it is. And uh, um, that's it. Thank you. Good. Yeah, well, um, my dad was an engineer, and his dad was an engineer, and his dad was an engineer. And I think I learned about engineering by falling out of trees. And because um, I used to like to try to clean, climb from one tree to another. And um, so I think you can have learned by building, you learn an intuition. And um, I think if you, uh, when um, uh, Raymond Pradesh talks about diesta, he talks about three different levels of intuition. And um, I think I'm only at the first one. But, um, but, um, but I think, you know, we all have an intuition about structure, and a lot of those intuitions about things we know about, like span to weight ratio. And, and, um, and I guess because um, I was an architectural technician before I became an architect, so I was always very technical. And so, I, so that intuition's always been kind of um, informed through experience, I think. Can I ask a question? Yeah. And the design of okay. Is there a okay. So if you if you had a, a piece of um, there's a few things about the perforation. So if you if you had a curving structure um, and you looked at it um, at an angle, um, that that curving structure not all of it's doing work. So you could take some of it away. So you could kind of turn it into a grid. But if if you didn't have any on that curving structure, didn't have any holes in it, um, you wouldn't be able to see how thin it was. And um, if it didn't have any holes in it, when you moved around, it wouldn't, it wouldn't change. And if it didn't have any holes in it, it wouldn't catch the light and actually um, um, give you a kind of difference where, where you moved. So there are quite a few factors about putting the holes in it that are about... Because so, I think, technically, a lot of people are, why are you filling it full of holes? You know, that sort of... That sort of um, it uses a lot more energy. I mean, it takes away weight, but... Um, but by taking away weight, we take away the dead weight, um, um, but it's used more energy to get there. And so, um, but we think the sort of, um, I didn't show you a project, we've done um, another competition for, a, um, um, it's for a, a service station, where when we started very early on, we talked about mollusks, and mollusks obviously don't have any holes in them, um, but they have a kind of, a, the mollusk basically is a soft thing inside a hard thing, and we always talked about, well, could we take the mollusk and pull it inside out and put the soft thing on top of the hard thing? And um, actually, some shells do do that. Um, but so there, what we've done is we've done a kind of shell-laced structure that spans 50 meters and sits on just two legs. But we've used a, um, a tensile roof on top of it that basically pulls it together. So the tensile roof kind of pulls everything back in. And so we've kind of added tension to the top. So you look up through the perforation, and then light lands on this blue cloth on top. 
and, um, and then you get this kind of blue light that kind of comes down through it. So the water doesn't come in, and we haven't, we haven't got to there in the Middle East worry about, and it keeps the sand off it, um, and we don't, we, don't want to, we don't have to worry about sort of insulation there. But there is a whole other layer of kind of how do you insulate these structures, and actually that's one of the things we're going to be kind of working on this year, and we've got, we, we've got a few ideas about how that happens. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what um, we'd like to build things out of them, but but um, what we're finding is that actually, so you can stack them and you could drill a hole through them and you could pull them into compression, and that's a kind of interesting way you can make kind of compression columns. Um, but actually, they, it ends up being quite expensive. So actually, to reuse them costs more than not reusing them. And actually, what we want to do. Um, when you buy steel, you basically pay for the steel you use. But what Alps are really keen on doing is finding some way that we can buy steel just for what we use. And we give the, we give the steel back, and, we, and, and so we only pay for the cost. We give the holes back. We give, <laughs> give them the holes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>